Guten Morgen, meine Freunde, wie geht es Ihnen? Willkommen to the sounds from around the big country town from the springtime of the summer of love as we visit the past that was a foreign country in the week ending October 15th, 1967. Bottoming out in the top 10 is a former three-week number one, San Francisco, Wear Some Flowers in Your Hair by Scott McKenzie, a cynical little slab of dope exploitation wrapped in a creamy candy kiss. At number nine, there they go, walking down the street, the Monkees, whose debut EP surprisingly topped out at only number three, beating their momentary retreat. The old story about Charles Manson trying out for the Monkees is a canard, he was in jail at the time, but it is true that Stephen Stills did. Had both Manson and Stills made the cut though, I wonder who Stills would have found it easier to work with, Charles Manson or Neil Young. I suspect the former. At number 8, up from 12 last week is Ichiku Park by The Small Faces, one of those records that Ace Face Steve Marriott would have later in his all too short life, rolled his eyes out when it was shouted to him as a request as he played in pubs with his band Packet of Three. Number 7 is a bit of a false sunset for Peter, Paul and Mary with I dig rock and roll music, stalling after five weeks on the chart. Written off at this point, they came back in 1969 with Leaving on a Jet Plane, which was their biggest hit. The momentum of this was effectively scuppered when Peter Yarrow was arrested and did three months hard for making improper advances to a 14-year-old girl. He was later pardoned by fellow Democrat Jimmy Carter, but the Me Too mob caught up with him somewhat in the last few years and he has lost some gigs because of it. Six is along with Ichiku Park, one of the earliest songs I can recall where I was when I heard it on the radio. It doesn't make it any good, but whatever. Bobby Gentry's Ode to Billy Joe. As slow, sleepy and somnambulistic as the human southern airs it is seemingly raised on, the song poses a kitchen sink drama and a dime store mystery against Gentry's befuddling drone of a voice. You know how they say you can have your own narratives but you can't have your own facts? Well, they're wrong, because it's time for Fowl's fantastic world of facts. Biggest riser this week is Living in a Child's Dream by Aussie group The Master's Apprentices, up 11 spots to 24, while the biggest fall from grace was a former five-week number one, All You Need Is Love, by those lovable, shaggy-haired, liver-pudly and acid freaks, The Beatles. The longest hanger in there on the charts is the aforementioned San Francisco, with 14 weeks. The coolest side hustle of anyone in the top 40 this week was undoubtedly that of Morgana King, who sat at number 27 with I Have Loved Me A Man, and who five years later played Mama Corleone in The Godfather and Godfather 2. It was the death of her character which led to Michael to give Al Neary the high sign to whack poor old Fredo. Poor old Fredo. Number one in the United States was the letter by the box tops, while on Carnaby Street the groovy groovers were grooving most groovily to Humpy Bong Boys, the Bee Gees, who struck pay dirt with Massachusetts. A bit of Bee Gees Humpy Bong trivia, a couple of years after he was dumped from the Bee Gees, drummer Colin Peterson formed a band called Humpy Bong, who swiped the singer from a band called Smile, opening a vacancy that was filled by that singer's friend. Smile morphed into Queen and that new singer into Freddie Mercury. That original singer, Tim Staffel, went on to design the original models for the Thomas the Tank Engine television series, thus establishing a vestigial Beatles connection. I'll give you one guess at what the number one album was. That's right, in the middle of a 30-week run at the top was Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the band that had that guy who worked on that television show that had the guy who was almost Queen's singer who built the toy trains. Let's move on to number five. Number five. I don't know why I'm getting so exciting. It's only three-week former number one, Don't Sleep in the Subway by Petula Clark. Call me cynical, but have you been to Central and Roma Street stations early in the morning these days? The subways are full of people sleeping in them. It's winter, you need a warm spot. Still, it's Petula Clark, it's fluff, she's no Dusty Springfield. Best vestigial Petula Clark story is that her biggest hit, Downtown, was recorded by Frank Sinatra for his Strangers in the Night album, and it's rather apparent that Sinatra is somewhat the worst for drink. And by rather, I mean very, very apparent. 
at the 60% completion mark here. Number four is Eric Burden and whatever motley assemblage of musicians he cared to call the animals at this point with San Francisco Nights. Looking at the desolation and anarchy that reigns in San Francisco at the moment, it's hard to tell that this song was even an imaginable fantasy back then. Number three brings us back to the first episode of this series with The Last Waltz by the hump himself Engelbert Humperdinck. This record was to seize the number one spot next week and then be deposed by four different records, Ichiku Park, Massachusetts by the Bee Gees, The Two of Us by Tony Hatch and Jackie Trent, and finally and fatally by Hello Goodbye, three times reclaiming the number one spot. Say what you will about the hump, but he has staying power. Number two, the irrepressible Cliff Richard is back with the vaguely hippie-ish Hank Marvin written The Day I Met Marie. Frankly, Cliff could sing the phone book in Polish for all I cared. I'd still dig his stuff. He didn't go true middle of the road until quite the late 1980s, but up to that point he was always a little towards one edge or the other. A slight critique of the song is the brass band arrangement of the chorus and after chorus, but that was the fashion of the time which, like so much of that half-dreamt summer, has dated poorly. But what was number one? A psychedelic sign of the times, a steamy, easy-listening loyan stirrer, or a popping popster with the birthday party beat? Only one man knows and only one man can introduce it. Gene, do your funky thing. Top of the tree this week is Florencia by Santa de Casillas Martinez Cardona, known to you and me, five presidents she sang for, and her besties Frank and Dino, as Vicky Carr, with her biggest and niggerest hit, the Grammy winning It Must Be Him. Milking every drop of emotion from the frankly puerile lyric, she is the anti Shirley Bassey. She's a river in flood, a house burning down a too much of a not especially good thing. Personally, I'm struggling to think of a weaker number one in our series so far, although it must be admitted I'm not thinking terribly hard. And thus ends our first venture into 1967. For a year which is so fondly regarded as revolutionary, it's a pretty ordinary top 10 we first encounter. Ah well, they can't all be duds. Join us next week and put your hand in the mystery hole to see what we come out clutching. Musical mastery or pretty pop pap? At a point in the past, the past which is a foreign country. Good now, I'm informed up to the first and possibly only ever FAQ that we attempt on this channel in honour of having received 100 subscribers. And I did receive some very interesting questions, so let's get down to them. Yeah, it's in my book. God once described Leonard Cohen as a lazy bastard living in a suit. I'd spent 35 years as a lazy bastard working in a suit, so I decided to um, get things square with God. It was just a, a, a branding mark, a visual presentation, and it helps differentiate the channel from other channels. Good question. Um, very simple. I don't really care the metal. I don't enjoy it. I don't know a great deal about it. And there are so many other metal channels covering it far better than I ever could. Um, I do have one metal video planned though, so we'll be seeing that in the back months time. What are some of my personal favourite videos that I've made? Um, I liked my one on Charlie Poole. I enjoyed the one on Taylor Swift um, from the point of view of making it. I did the Derbyshire I enjoyed a great deal. Uh, Four Kings I put an awful lot of work into. Of course the, the Dusty Springfield video. Well, given I try not to make typical videos, uh, they can run from about 12 hours work for uh, the past as a foreign country to I think the longest is the second part of the 1950s 
which took 144 hours. Four Kings took 120 hours, but other ones take considerably less. Native Cheese asked about um, my particular peculiar turn of phrase and my favourite authors who may have framed that. I don't know if there are particularly any favourite authors who may have framed the turn of phrase, I simply just like the mangle language. Um, at the moment I'm reading Charles Yu's Interior Chinatown. I reread Delia Falcon, she's an Australian author. Her two spectacular novels, The Service of Clouds and The Lost Thoughts of Soldiers. Well, I, I watch the same channels you've all otherwise that you're commenting on various channels. I, I watch largely the same people. Um, Kyle's Track by Track is a remarkable channel. He can put more information into a four minute video than I can in half an hour. Um, I like Gary's physical format, Rock and Roll. He's a out there friendly guy, um, works direct the camera, does a lot of things that I can't possibly do. I'll say I'm also very much enjoying the experience of being a patron of my classic album review uh, for the nugatory sum of money that they ask uh, per month. You get a tremendous value for it, a tremendous sense of having your thoughts valued by a broader community. So I would recommend that highly. Jen Kaplan. Jen has been with us since G. Jen, Sally, and maybe Viva Trump. They've, they've been here since day one. They've been a real long time. I would say something that I heard on the radio in 1971 or 72 Hot Love, Bang and Bong, Metal Guru, Children of Revolution, all that. Those T Rex singles were absolutely formative to me. Um, Green Onions by Booker T and the MG made me want to be a guitar player. Echo for the Deplorables, you and me both, kid, you and me both. There's no music I won't listen to. Um, there's plenty of music I don't particularly like, but then I sat through an hour and a quarter of uh, banging EDM tunes at uh, the Colonial Music Festival last week and it didn't kill me, so that's a plus. My favourite ever is Steve Cropper. Uh, then there's Roy Nickel, who played with Merle Haggard for many, many years. Uh, Don Rich, who was Buck Owens' guitar player, who died sadly in a motorcycle accident in 1974. Uh, Bill Kirchin, the hammer of the honky tonk gods. Most people would know him for his solos with uh, Commander Cody's Lost Planet M and particularly Hot Rod Lincoln and Lost in the Ozone again. Earl Travis, the hillbilly Hendrix. Uh, remarkable, remarkable player of Earl Travis. And of course, speaking of Jimi Hendrix, he's untouchable. Nobody's come close to, to Jimi Hendrix in terms of what he did what he was capable of doing. Uh, my pronouns are <laughs> my pronouns are F U and F off. Asks, is punk dead? And who are my favourite punk bands? But who was it who says that punk rock died the moment the first punk rocker said punk's not dead? So Morrissey who said that? Anyway, that's the way I feel about. Favourite punk bands are, you know, I can sit here and name Australian bands who never even released a record that would make my, my list. You know, Radio Birdman or also the Flames of Pan is a great fun. Um, the Hard Ons, and Tim Rogers singing for them now, they're a, a terrific group. I tend to like American punk bands, uh, English punk bands, so you've got the Minutemen, I'm an enormous fan of the Dead Kennedys. Jimmy G as a two-parter, uh, if you could travel back in time to see one concert, who, when and where would it be? And if you could enjoy a cold beer with any musician, well that rules out the English musicians, doesn't it? Living or dead, who might it be? Uh, the gig one is very easy, I don't really care where or when, it was always between 1964 and 1968, but it would be to see James Brown. How would you with any musician? There's only two that come to mind that I, I could possibly like. I mean, I could say, oh, I'd love to have a beer with David Bowie, but David Bowie and I have nothing in common. He's 40 times smarter than I am to start with. I've always thought Jeff Beck seemed like a nice guy, so a nice beer with old Jeff Beck would be good. And on the 40 times smarter scale of things, I think I'd be, be taking my life in my own hands, but I think I could possibly have a decent conversation with Donald Fagan. And that's about it. I'd be too fanboyish with a lot of other ones and we'd just sit there talking about their music. That concludes us. Thank you so much for your time. I hope it hasn't been too tedious as I sit here in my potting shed in the 
rank crepuscular dimness of a very, very pleasant spring day in northern Australia. And I do hope to see you again shortly once we're back to business as usual on the Righteous Bird Channel.